After years of renting, Caitlin Hilliard and Ben Weinberg were thrilled to be able to buy a townhouse in a neighborhood they loved just outside Chicago. We never really thought we'd be homeowners. It was the American dream come true until they realized their neighbor was a nightmare. When they're sitting out there idling, what's it like? Sometimes it's like sleeping inside a factory. The couple live about 300 feet, the same distance as 20 parking spaces from a spot where trains are often stationed for hours. And every time a train stops here to idle, we write down the date, the day of the week, the time it arrives, Ben and Caitlin started tracking trains in a detailed database after noticing the recurring problem. Because while they knew about the tracks before they bought the house and expected trains running by, over time they realized many would end up standing still with their engines running, something that's often done to keep the train's fluids warm and crews comfortable. This is just the beginning. It could yeah. be worse. Yes, this yeah. is a conservative estimate. Just last year, the pair charted more than 400 trains they say idled outside their townhome community. A little white sign on the tracks is the only signal this could be a spot for trains to stop. When they do, they say it averages between 90 minutes and three hours. One locomotive Caitlin and Ben recorded sat idling for more than 30 hours. It's just so sporadic. And the volume is so great. And I think the spreadsheet really helps communicate that. Communicating about idling trains has become almost a second job for these two, who have reached out constantly for months to the company whose train cars sit parked outside their home, congressional lawmakers, and even federal agencies, doggedly laying out their case, documenting the problem. We shouldn't be the ones monitoring this railroad situation. Somebody who actually has some power, like the government, should be monitoring it. But the feds aren't specifically tracking idling trains, despite fears and frustration reported in cities across the nation. Our national investigative team wanted to take an even deeper look into the problem. We dug through blocked crossing data from the Federal Railroad Administration dating back to 2019 and discovered dozens of complaints that mention idling from a train sitting with its engines on for three days in Nashville to a locomotive idling and popping at all hours in southern Georgia. Health concerns are also highlighted in complaints from Alabama to Illinois and Texas. They're echoed loudly in California, where our team obtained complaints specifically about idling trains, tracked by a state agency focused on curbing pollution and fighting climate change. In that data, there's talk of toxic smoke and diesel fumes causing breathing issues and nausea as trains park for days or weeks at a time, idling and impacting neighbors. Ben and Caitlin know just how they feel. The fumes really freak us out. So we can sometimes smell diesel inside this room. They're just spewing whatever they spew into the air that we breathe for hours every single day. I just worry about the long-term health implications of that. For good reason. Studies have found people living near rail lines and rail yards have lowered lifespans, increased asthma, heart and lung disease rates, and a risk of cancer because of the exposure to particulate matter that comes from train emissions. Experts say millions of people in low-income communities of color are especially affected. But despite the Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, saying it's well aware of the health impacts of train emissions from idling, critics say the agency hasn't done enough to stop it. The last time EPA updated its emission standards was 15 years ago. We continue to suffer. That's Yvette Torres with the People's Collective for Environmental Justice, who testified virtually in a Senate hearing last July on behalf of 50 groups nationwide. The Moving Forward Network is calling on Congress and the EPA to take action and update regulations that govern the rail industry's emissions. We know that technology is here and it's feasible, economically feasible, to go completely zero emissions. We need standards that are higher and better than the 2008 standards. The current EPA standards from 2008 sound good on paper. They say any locomotive or engine made after 2015 has to be equipped with idling control systems that shut off engines after 30 minutes. But experts testified very few of them have been made. So much of what remains on the rails is old with outdated technology. We've made strong commitments. Ian Jeffries, the leader of the rail lobby, says companies have invested more than a billion dollars to modernize, but it can't happen overnight.
we all want to do a, a job uh, uh, in, in a way that reduces emissions and continually reduces our environmental impact, um, but it's got to be done in a way that can allow us to continue to operate, serve our customers, serve our commu communities, and uh, that the, the production market can actually handle. In the meantime, we discovered the industry has been able to use a loophole in the EPA rules that deals with updating older trains, the ones the government calls non-new. There's these automatic shutoff devices. You don't have to use those unless you remanufacture the engine, which could be 50 years. And then there's no enforcement by the feds of idling in those older trains. States have also been long powerless to regulate trains because of federal law. But David Pettit, senior attorney with the Natural Resources Defense Council, says a recent change made by the EPA gives his home state of California the chance to adopt and create emission standards for those non-new trains with the agency's blessing. The move will create a legal battle he says could go on for years. They'd rather see California take the heat on this than have to deal with the political and legal ramifications themselves. Who has failed when federal agencies don't step in and exercise their power? Who pays the cost for that? Well, my clients who live across the fence line from the rail yards, they pay the cost for it. Those neighbors are paying with their health and their lives in order to support railroad profits. The Association of American Railroads, the industry lobbying group that testified on the Hill, wouldn't speak on camera. Their rep told our national investigative team trains that idle for an extended time are not in the community's or industry's interest, and that railroads have made significant efforts to reduce idling, implemented extensive measures to reduce rail yard emissions, and improve air quality for nearby communities. For its part, the EPA declined an interview, but told us it's been engaging with stakeholders since 2022, evaluating how best to address rail emissions and is developing a set of options and recommendations for regulatory action. What I would tell rail yard neighbors is to beat on EPA as often and as hard as they can. Because EPA, in my opinion, can do something about this if it wants to. Caitlin Hilliard and Ben Weinberg are banging the drum everywhere they can on behalf of communities who might not have the time or resources to do it themselves. You should not be treating human beings like this, especially these, these companies have so much money. Union Pacific, the company whose trains idle outside their door, said it's been using this spot for crew changes and transfers for years with few complaints or issues. Still, they said they're taking steps to address Ben and Caitlin's concerns, planting evergreens to serve as a buffer, which sounds like not enough to the people who live this close by and is a solution that hardly gets to the root of the problem. These two say they'll keep battling. Well, as long as we're here, we're going to fight as much as we can.